My name is uh, Michael Strong. I'm a researcher here at the University of Western Ontario in the Robarts Research Institute. I'm currently the Dean of the Schulich School of Medicine and Dentistry and have been in that role for about uh, two years. But for the 20 years prior to that, uh, and still to this day, I've been a researcher and clinician studying amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or Lou Gehrig's disease. Why I was interested in research in ALS, it's really been the patients and their families that I've worked with. And the ability to have a patient or their family say, well, we understand it's a dev devastating disease, but what are you doing about it? And I think if I, if I answered nothing, um, or I'm just, I'm just treating patients without trying to push the field forward, that would have been really unsatisfying for me. And I think for them as well. Uh, and, and so the, the relationship, the bond that I've had with many of the families that I've looked after and the patients has really been on the basis of, you know, I'm in the clinic and when I leave the clinic, I come here and try and understand what it is that's happening. Well, what we're learning in ALS is that almost certainly ALS is a disorder of the RNA. How it's stabilized, how it's constructed, where it sits within the cells, multiple different pathways. And one of the pieces in our lab that we've been very instrumental in, in fact, uh, were one of the leading labs in discovering, was that RNA abnormalities are common amongst many different variants of ALS. So whether you have an inherited form or whether you have one that's occurring just out of the blue, when we look into these cells, we find that this RNA is depositing in an abnormal fashion. And more importantly, that the proteins that regulate it are what we call RNA binding proteins. What you'll actually see is that you'll see the RNA binding proteins forming these fibrils and that they then become pathological markers of the cell for it. We've also been very interested in understanding non-motor manifestations of ALS and have been working very hard at understanding what we call the cognitive syndromes. So when we think about dementias, for instance, we think about Alzheimer's disease. But there is a whole group of dementias that are not Alzheimer's that involve what we call the frontal regions of the brain. These regions are very important for behavior, for executive skills, for emotional control, uh, for the day-to-day -day essence of what you would consider to be your being. So how do you make decisions? How do you multitask? And, and when we look very carefully in the ALS population, there is an abnormality in that area of processing. It's hotly contested as to what the basis of that is. We've been doing work over the course of the last 15 years to describe that using imaging techniques from here, pathology, clinical aspects ultimately demonstrating that this is an abnormality of a protein as well. Those areas of experiments, the ability to actually start to look at the questions of how the brain functions, how to image it, or to begin to understand the very basics of the RNA biology, all of that work was actually made possible because of donations that we received from the community. Uh, whether it was donations that we received directly, uh, so through fundraisers such as Pancake Breakfasts, or through donors like Michael Halls, for instance, for the period of 1990 to 1993 approximately, there were three investigators in Canada funded to do ALS research. Myself, Heather Durham, and Jean-Pierre Julien. That was it, and we all had one-year grants. You can imagine that when you look at a lab like we now have here, where it costs a quarter million dollars a year to run this lab, to have one grant for one year's time doesn't allow you to do anything. It, you're basically writing your next grant before you've even finished what you're supposed to be doing in the first place. The transformation in ALS research, really led by the ALS Society of Canada over the course of the last decade, has been to place that funding on a solid basis so that investigators like myself, my colleagues here in the lab, know that we have multi-year funding to move forward. We still depend on the individual donors though, individuals who come forward and say, gee, if I gave you $50, what would this do? It would buy pipettes, it would allow me to do an experiment and actually begin to get the early proof of principle. So when you ask questions about how important is it to have donors, to have the ALS Society of Canada behind research like what we do here and my colleagues in Canada, you now only need to look and ask the question, well, what happened to the three of you? Well, the three of us are now over 100 that are either students or laboratories or programs or clinical research programs that are now focused on ALS research across the entirety of the spectrum. And I think realistically, we can now say that Canada is one of the lead countries in the world for studying Lou Gehrig's disease. We're well respected for the type of work that we do. That would never have happened without the type of support that we received from our donors. So the things that we do right now in the lab, absolutely critical, help us move the understanding of the disease forward, would never have happened 
uh, without the kinds of support that we've received from our donors. So for that, we're very appreciative and would like to thank you.